Hello, Jamie. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jamie is leaving right after this to go back to vote in, yes. in the American elections today. <laughs> so um, we're so grateful to have her here. Uh, so Jamie, when you were in intelligence, you determined the content of what, what's known as the President's Daily Briefing, which is the PDB, the top secret daily intel document delivered to the President about the threats around the globe. So I want to sort of take a tour of the world with you. You've done this with us before and ask you to give us your take on each region, but maybe more for the business climate. So let's call it the BDB, the Business Daily Brief. Okay. <laughs> okay. Why don't we just start with, um, uh, you know, in the U.S. we have really important elections today, but let's talk about the U.S. since so much has happened there over the past few years. Contributing to global uncertainty has been um, the U.S. maybe protectionist turn, impact, impacting global trade, pullback as a leader on the global stage, uh, just to name a few things. So what do you think um, has been the impact of all of this on the rest of the world from a security standpoint, and how might things play out today in the elections? <laughs> well, um, you know, there are a couple of uh, tabloid newspapers in New York. One's the the Post, the other one's the Daily News, and I saw the headline on one of them this morning. Um, they're just famous for their headlines. And about the election, it said, your call, America. And I thought, that's perfect, right? You know, you go to the polling place, make your vote. That's, that's what will determine what the next two to, to six years look like, I think. Um, you know, my sense is that uh, the last couple of years have introduced so much uncertainty into the geopolitical mix. Um, people who, you know, e either are allies, countries that, you know, have differences with the U.S., they all kind of thought they could anticipate what a U.S. response would be um, to an international issue. And that really has kind of gone away uh, with, with the election of President Trump, you know, an outsider who had never held political office before, frankly wasn't beholden to any um, special interest group, really got there just on his own. Um, and on the force of his personality. So probably had more um, running room, if you will, um, to make policies in new and different ways. And I think you're seeing that play out, um, different policies in new and different ways that really is leading to a lot of uncertainty. Our allies in Europe not knowing if they can rely on us as much, not knowing if we're going to have a stand in Asia the way we used to or the Middle East. Um, you know, one of his first moves to pull us out of the the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which was, I think, a decision that he made uh, exclusively based on the fact that he's not a fan of multilateral uh, agreements. He uh, saw it only as an economic issue and not probably in that broader national security context mm -hmm. as well. You mentioned the Middle East. There was a lot of talk about Saudi Arabia yesterday and just the situation with the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and the business community's response to it and what is going to happen. Um, how do you think things are going to play out here? Yeah. You know, it's really too soon to tell. And, and the reason I say that is not to avoid answering your question, <laughs> but um, the Saudis have to figure out how it's going to play in Saudi Arabia. Inside the royal family, they are still trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I read this morning that the king, King Salman, who had kind of devolved most of the power to his son, uh, the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, um, it, but the king is now going, going to go out on a tour of Saudi Arabia, which to me says he needs to show that he's in charge, that he's, you know, don't worry, you know, we will get through this. I'm still very much engaged. I have not turned over all my power. And I think, you know, all of the rumors you heard about early abdication, that he may, you know, leave the stage in, in favor of his, his son, the crown prince, I think those are now all on hold. There was a major Saudi royal, uh, the last full brother of the king, uh, who went back to Saudi Arabia last week. I think they're trying to figure out, will he have a greater role to play in, uh, you know, maybe taking some of the uh, portfolios away from the crown prince, or will he be, you know, one of the people who winds up, you know, perhaps under a house detention of some mm -hmm. sort. So until Saudi Arabia figures out its own internal situation, I think it's going to be very hard for businesses to, to make a decision on what they should be doing. I mean, it's, it came up yesterday. I think Nina made the point that we know what we need to know. Everyone keeps saying, a lot of CEOs keep saying, well, we have to wait and find out and see what, what really happened. I mean, we know what really happened, right? He's dead. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and we know who did it. I we mean, know that the Saudis did it. Yes. yes, yeah. 
So anyway, so um, do you think this is going to continue to be a big issue for businesses then, figuring out how to navigate this? You know, I think it's going to depend on what sector your business is in. Mm -hmm. If you are in sectors that are, you know, very high profile, increasing the Saudis' capability to, uh, you know, spy on its own citizens or, you know, those types of things, you're going to be having a different set of questions to answer than if you're, say, in the healthcare sector or, um, you know, things that are more designed for, like, infrastructure development. So I think CEOs are going to have um, different calculations to make. The one thing I would just encourage people to be thinking about, though, is if this really gains momentum, and for right now it's kind of been pushed off the newspapers in the United States because we, we do have the midterms today. We had the, you know, killings at the synagogue and... Uh, Pittsburgh, we had these uh, pipe bombs that were sent to prominent uh, Democrat, uh, largely Democratic officials. Um, so this kind of went you know, to the inside of the newspaper, if you will use the old terminology. But I think it's going to come back when Congress comes back into session. And if there is a momentum that develops, you may very well see activism from your shareholders. Um, you know, like uh, in the days when uh, shareholders started mounting uh, boycotts of anything that invested in South Africa during the apartheid type of thing. You could see that type of activism, I think, come back. Let's go all the way across the world to China. Um, Henry Kissinger once said that the peace and prosperity of the world relies on China and the U.S. finding a way to deal with their problems. Uh, now we have an emboldened China seeking to fill the void as the U.S. is ret retreated from the global stage, taking aggressive action in the South China Sea. Uh, this trade war that shows no signs of going away, although maybe you think differently. Um, where does all this end or where could this end? And what do you think the future of U.S.-China relations will look like? in, you know, how many minutes? <laughs> Just kidding. I love the easy questions. <laughs> um, I think the China-U.S. relationship needs to be bifurcated. And, and, and by that, I mean there's kind of the short term and the tactical, and there's the long term and the strategic. And I think that short term tactical will probably figure out a way to get through the, the most immediate trade war tensions. Uh, at the G20 uh, summit at the end of November, uh, it takes place in uh, Buenos Aires, that uh, President Xi and President Trump want to have a meeting, I believe. I think they want to have this bilateral uh, setting in which they can say that they've both um, you know, reached some sort of an accord. Now, I think they'll probably find ways to get there, but that doesn't mean that everything is fine. It doesn't mean that everything is now behind us. Um, that's the short term and the tactical. You know, I think if you talk to a lot of uh, Chinese uh, government officials, academics, uh, if you talk to people in the US, um, especially in some of the think tanks, you're seeing a hardening of positions, I think, on both the US and Chinese side when it comes to this relationship. And I was in uh, Asia, two weeks ago, and I started to hear a lot of talk about, you know, yes, we may reach a deal on trade, but this is a Cold War. You have started a Cold War again. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, but if that's a going in proposition, if that's the way um, they're going to be, you know, acting and dealing with us, then I think we have a much longer term and much more strategic issue at hand. And what about, um, I, I, we're really zigzagging all over the world here, but um, you know, there's been this rise of, of populism and nationalism really all over the world. I mean, primarily in Europe, but now in Brazil. Um, what is, how big a deal is this and, and what could it mean? Yeah. I think this is, you know, even though we focus so much on populists and the rise of populism, I still think in a lot of ways it's underreported in terms of how significant this might be. Um, basically, you've had a lot of people feel that they are not, their interests are not represented by their leaders, right? So whether it was in the United States with the election of President Trump or in Brazil this past weekend, you see it in places like Poland and Hungary and, um, you know, I could keep going. But what we haven't seen is we haven't seen that um, do much more than just take place within the, the existing political structure, right? So it's via the elections or via the ballot box that, that these changes are happening. My concern is that if, if these people who feel that the system did not represent them well now have put their person in who they think is going to be different and going to make that change, and if that person doesn't then deliver on the change, 
what's their next move? What do they go to? And is it protests in the streets? Is it something that turns more violent, more extremist? Um, and I think we haven't seen this play out yet. Um, if there's one issue that I think is, is vastly uh, underrepresented in the, the international discussion, it really is, you know, starts with income inequality, mm -hmm. but it quickly goes on to what happens when we automate away so many people's jobs who aren't anticipating that they will be the ones who lose their jobs. Um, a lot of professionals, a lot of um, you know, lower end, more routinized types of professions. Um, what will they do? You know, what, what will they see as their self-worth if they're not employed, if they don't have um, a sense of community that we all get from going to work every, every day? So I think, I think those are real questions. And so I, I think the potential for this to turn more, um, I don't want, violent makes it sound too extreme, but to go from just a, a ballot casting exercise to something mm -hmm. more is. This is the daily brief. You can be extreme. This is the <laughs> intel. Um, uh, do you think, so every CEO we've had on our stage for the past few weeks at our CEO forum and here, I mean, everyone is talking about the need for reskilling mm -hmm. and, and everyone is talking about this and doing things, but is the business community doing enough to, uh, to provide an antidote to the, the position you just laid out? Well, I think it's hard. You know, I, it's hard to know what the anecdote is when you don't really know what you're you're facing, mm -hmm. right? And um, you know, the same thing is true in government as it is in business. The urgent will crowd out the important, mm -hmm. right? You know, so you've got to deal with the problems that you're facing right now. It's harder to think about that 20-year problem. Um, you know, I think for uh, for CEOs, the focus is on we can see the skills we're going to need and trying to get those skills into your, your, your firm or your business. But you know, what about all those skills that you don't need anymore? That probably doesn't get as much focus. Um, what happens to those people? A lot of people who won't be retrained, can't be retrained, who will just want to cling to what they used to be doing. I think that's going to be a challenge for yeah. everybody. And there's no clear answer. Security issue. So does anyone have a question for Jamie? We have a question over here. Please identify yourself. Hi, it's Pat. Wow, it's loud. I'm Patty Shugart, RBC Capital Markets. Can you talk about um, women in the in today's election and the importance of the women voting and how you analyze that group because it's large and diverse uh, and how you bucket them and think about it? I'm just yeah. I'm sure you've thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so these midterm elections in the United States, um, every seat in our House of Representatives is up uh, for re-election today. For the first time, there are more than 200 women running in the midterm elections. I think it's 237 running for the House seats. It is an incredibly diverse group, and I would say this is true for, for men as well. I mean, it is the most diverse group of candidates I think we've ever seen. So the real positives, as I see it in the US, are so many more people are, vote, are, are focused on elections. If you had talked to people four years ago, or maybe maybe even eight years ago, they would have said, yeah, you know, I don't have to vote. We know how this is going to turn out. Uh, I think after the 2016 election, where they realized how close it could be in some key states and how that can really turn an election, it really motivated people. So uh, if you look at the early returns that are coming in, um, I mean, sorry, the, the number of people who have engaged in early voting, um, off the charts, almost double what it was uh, at the last midterms. You know, I think the, the interesting thing about women running is that there are a couple of races where um, they could wind up with two female senators from a given state. I mean, it's just unprecedented in that regard. The one thing I think is interesting, though, is there are also a huge number of military veterans who are also running, um, people who have served in the uh, uniform services either in um, Iraq, Afghanistan, or the National Guard. Um, a lot of those people, I think, will have a very different perspective coming into government, which is much more of an ability to work across an aisle, because you've worked in units in the field or in uh, you know, dangerous situations. I think there might be more ability to uh, negotiate, reach across, um, and, and reach agreement. So some of them are female, some of them aren't, but I think that's, that's also an encouraging development. Mm -hmm. so. Any other question? I think we have time for one more. 
Um, I have a question. Um, when you were with us in, in California last month, you mentioned something that I had never heard of before. We asked you about cyber threats. And you talked about a threat that you see as more important than cyber attacks. Can you explain that a little bit, or a related threat, yeah. but something people really don't think about that's scary? <laughs> what I was saying is I think we're, we've gone through a couple of different generations on cyber attacks and cyber security. And you all spend, I'm sure, enormous amounts of money worrying about cybersecurity issues. But you know, first generation was kind of you know the hacker in the basement who just wanted to show he could do it, right, or she could do it. Um, the second was well, big denial of service um, types of things, where I'm going to stop you from doing whatever it is you want to do in your business or or and the like. Third generation was kind of. Now, I'm doing this for economic gain. I'm going to steal data, and I'm going to sell it to people, and I'm going to take your identity, and I'm going to use it to my own financial uh, benefit. My fear is that we're probably now getting to a point where we might have a fourth generation, which is what I would call data manipulation. They don't steal the data. They just change the data. So if you're a business and all of a sudden you don't know what your inventories are or where they are, or if you're a financial services firm and all of a sudden balances have been changed in accounts, but you know maybe the money didn't move, but you just don't know exactly where it is anymore. If you think about that kind of an attack, which would more likely than not be a state-sponsored attack, on confidence in the economy, at a time when we're already questioning the confidence we have in our political leaders, our media, um, I think that's that's something that that concerns me. It's very scary. I had never heard of that before, and I just you know. Anyway, I wish we could end on an optimistic <laughs> note, but we have to end there. But now you're all informed. You know what to look out for. Please join me in thanking Jamie for this incredible conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Hope you get Thanks. back in time. Thanks.